Hello, everyone. Um, we are here for the third webinar of the European Union Law and Sustainable Development webinar series. Um, we have the pleasure of having with us Faustine bade -Fosse, a head of agriculture and land management at the Institute for European Environmental Policy. And uh, with this, I would uh, like to immediately give the floor to uh, Professor Pavoni, the academic coordinator of the European Law and Sustainable Development module for a quick introduction of our speaker. Okay, thank you, Dario. And uh, I just would like to say a couple of words and then immediately give the floor to Faustine Bade Fosse. Uh, we are delighted to have her here with us for our third webinar of our series related to the connected to our module, Jamone module. And I would like to say that Faustine is going to talk about the environmental dimension of the EU common agricultural policy, uh, focusing on the current state and the post-2020 challenges. I think this is a very important topic for our module as a whole, because it's uh, directly uh, related to many sustainable development goals of the United Nations. Of course, uh, uh, goal number two, zero hunger, is directly connected to her talk, but also there is a variety of goals which are more or less directly uh, uh, related to, the, to, her, to her talk. I would like to remember goal number 12, uh, responsible consumption and production, about which we also had a, a keynote lecture by Professor Scott recently, and also some of the more environmental goals, such as climate action, number 13. Uh, just a couple of words on the biography of uh, Faustine Bade Fossé. As, as Dario has, has mentioned, she's currently head of agriculture and land management program at the Institute for Environment, uh, European Environmental Policy in Brussels. I just would like to say that this is an important non-for-profit organization with over 40 years of experience in a, in, a, in, a, in a variety of, of areas relating to environmental law and policy. So we are particularly happy to have this connection with the Institute in Brussels. Uh, Faustine previously um, held a lot, uh, a series of positions at the European Environmental Bureau, always in Brussels. And she has also some experience, if I well understand, with the European Commission directly, where she worked uh, in uh, many positions uh, in the in the past always connected to the dg agriculture if i well understand she holds uh, a master's degree in european politics and public affairs from the institute for europe on political sciences in strasbourg and a bachelor of law from lille the university of lille uh, so faustin you have the floor thank you thanks again for accepting our invitation well thank you thank you for the invitation i'm very pleased to be here um, so, as you said, uh, I'll be talking about the environmental dimension of the current and post 2020 CAP, and it's not only extremely relevant because indeed the CAP and SDGs are uh, interlinked in a way because agriculture and environment are interlinked per se. Uh, agriculture relies on natural resources for its future, but also it's extremely timely because, um, and I will explain that in my presentation, uh, the Commission uh, has uh, just uh, um, less than a month ago uh, released uh, its proposals uh, on the future of the common agricultural policy. So uh, without waiting any further, I'll dive into my uh, presentation, have prepared a couple of slides. I'll go through them and I'll be happy to respond to questions afterwards uh, if there is any. So yes, I'm um, actually taking just a moment to remind our uh, audience that they can start typing uh, their question already um, and on the box on the right of the um, YouTube live video and we will collect those questions and ask them if there are any at the end of the presentation of Ms. Padefosse. I'll give you the floor and uh, yeah, you can share your screen now. Yeah, thank you. I hope this will work. Let me see. Can you see it? Yes. yes. Good. Wonderful. Uh, so a brief outline of my presentation today. Um, first of all, I'll just give um, a brief introduction of where we are in terms of the timeline. Uh, I just mentioned that the proposals uh, were released at the beginning of the month, but I will explain also what are the next steps. 
Um, I was asked also to look at the current environmental performance uh, of the, the CAP now, uh, not the future one. So I'll give a few words and I have a few slides on that as well. Uh, then I will dive into the next common agricultural policy. What is in the pipeline? Uh, what is envisaged for the environment? Uh, I'll try to give a comparison between the two models. Uh, what are the differences and what that means also potentially for the environment? And I will also try uh, at the end of my presentation to um, summarize the risk um, in a way for the environment, but also the safeguards in the, in the proposals and potentially the new opportunities in a nutshell. And I will finish with a couple of uh, uh, recommendations that uh, the Institute already put uh, online as a reaction to the, to the proposals when they were published uh, in June, early June this year. So where are we in terms of the timeline? Uh, you will see I have two slides on timeline, one on the cap and one on the budget, uh, because the budget is obviously extremely important, uh, because let's remind ourselves that the current common agricultural policy is around 40% of the EU budget, so more or less 58 billion of euros spent on this policy annually. So obviously the discussion on the future of the EU budget are extremely relevant to the one on the cap and vice versa. And uh, very often, as I was explain, uh, the budget discretion uh, are driving the ones on the policy itself. So the current cap uh, ends in 2020, as does the current budgetary period of the European Union. Uh, the Commission launched its proposals, as I said uh, earlier on, uh, in June 1st, 2018, so this year, early this month. Uh, these proposals uh, were following a public consultation uh, that was uh, made between February and May 2017 by the European Commission. Uh, it's quite worth mentioning that uh, this was the, the most popular <laughs> consultation ever, in a way, because uh, I think they got uh, 322,000 responses to their consultation. So that was quite um, uh, historical in a way, because it's not that often that they have such a high number of participation. I think uh, they got a lot also on the Nature's uh, Directive uh, um, uh, fitness check uh, proposal uh, consultation. Uh, I think they got 500,000 on that one, but that was uh, historically the highest, <laughs> uh, most popular consultation ever. Uh, there was also communication, um, as you know, you always have a communication before the legal proposals, and the communication uh, highlighting the plans of the Commission were published uh, in November, end of November last year. Now the proposals need to be amended, uh, adopted by the co-legislators. Here it's important to say that there is a lot of uncertainties uh, because the European elections are coming very soon, in May next year, as you all know. And uh, if we look at what happened last time around, the revision took two years and a half uh, uh, for, to be, for the, 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 the process to end up in a political deal. Uh, so if we look at now, between now and May next year, there is less than two and a half year, obviously. So it seems very unrealistic unre that there will be um, a deal before the European election. So that might delay the process a bit because then you need the new commission to be in place, a new parliament, etc. So uh, it's very unclear when the political deal will be found on this uh, future uh, cap. Uh, in any case, the new legislation should enter into force in 2021 because the current cap concludes in 2020 and also because, as I said, it follows the budget negotiation and the budget uh, uh, of the EU, which also ends in 2020. As I said, uh, the CAP budget will strongly influence the, the final agreement on the CAP because very often uh, we see it already in the discussion in the Council, uh, member states claim that uh, because there will be budget cuts on the CAP, and I will come back to that, then the level of ambition uh, when it comes to the environment uh, should not be higher. Uh, that's one of their, uh, of, their, of their arguments right now for some of the member states. Uh, so where are we with the budget negotiations? So the, as the CAP, the, they conclude in 2020, as I was just saying, uh, the Commission launched its proposals for the new MFF, so the multi-annual financial framework, in May this year, so a month before the CAP proposals. 
and this is a high priority for the Commission. So uh, the the president of the Commission said that uh, a deal should be found before May 2019 on that, and that is the highest priority of the uh, of, of the of the EU right now is to find a deal on the on the budget. In terms of the figures, what that would mean uh, the MFF for the cap? Well, there is a cut of five uh, percent uh, that is envisaged for the cap. One thing that uh, is potentially bad for the environment is that uh, actually the cuts will be somehow disproportionate and there will be higher cuts in the second pillar of the cap so the rural development where you have multi-annual programs and also multi-annual programs for the environment so higher cuts in that part of the cap than in the first part of the cap where you have the direct payments and annual payments that are delivering less environmental goods than uh, the pillar two measures, the second pillar measures. So this is, let's say, bad news in a way uh, for the environment potentially. So what's the current cap structure? Uh, right now, the cap is divided into two pillars, direct payments and uh, rural development. Uh, this is not meant to change in the future cap period. Uh, it should be the same structure um, with the two pillars. Underneath the two pillars, you have cross compliance. Uh, this is the light uh, green uh, box on the screen. Uh, this is the mechanism that ensures that farmers who receive uh, subsidies uh, under the cap are in compliance uh, with the EU legislation on environment, on health, and on animal welfare. But you also have a part that, and I will come back to that, that are the uh, good agriculture and environmental conditions, so GAEC, which are two basic requirements to make sure that the land is in good condition for the environment. Last, so in the current cap, uh, what was decided was that there would be 30% of uh, direct payments that would be devoted to greening. Uh, so 30% of the envelope devoted to three practices. I will come back to that. And also within rural development, the second pillar, there would be also 30% minimum spending for environment and climate, so measures such as agri-environmental and climate measures. Because you have to know that in rural development, we don't only have uh, environmental measures, we also have measures uh, related to investments, for instance, or others. So um, what are the current instruments uh, in the cap for environmental uh, protection. Uh, so as I said, cross compliance is one because it's a mechanism to make sure that farmers comply with the environmental legislation. So you have the legal requirements, the so-called statutory management requirements and the good agriculture and environmental conditions, uh, which member states can tailor a bit to their national conditions. Then you have the greening. So in that, the three practices are the ecological focus areas, so these areas were meant to be there to protect biodiversity. Initially, they were meant to be landscape elements preserved on farmland for biodiversity uh, protection. Uh, you also have um, a protection of environmentally sensitive grasslands and member states having to set a ban on plowing on environmentally sensitive grasslands in Natura 2000 and outside and crop diversification. And then you have rural development with, again, 30% minimum spending for environmental measures. So it's not just like environmental measures, but also other measures, as you see listed on the screen. Overall, what was our assessment of the current environmental performance um, of the CAP? Well, Overall, it was pretty pretty low. Um, why so? Well, very much because um, in the last uh, reform, what happened is that the Commission put its proposals on the table and then it went through the co-legislators co as it would for the future now. And co-legislators um, included a lot of flexibility into the, the text, into the legal text. And the situation we ended up with is that now, we see that member states have used flexibility not to optimize the environmental performance of the policy, but actually to almost systematically go for the least ambitious measure for the environment. And overall, that means that the performance of the cap, uh, the environmental performance is pretty low. And this is pretty disappointing. Um, so in italic, you would see what we set as recommendations uh, for the current cap period. So we said that in order to uh, uh, somehow tackle that problem, member states should be required to justify their implementation choices with reference to environmental needs and priorities, because that is not that is not the case at all now. Member states, when picking up 
you know, when using the flexibility for greening, for instance, they have to notify the commission, but they don't have to justify why they have made that choice on environmental grounds. So that's, that led to a low optimization also of the greening choices. Member states have not necessarily tried to use the different uh, measures that I have listed here and, and try to use it to optimize the environmental performance on the cap. They have systematically not done that actually. Uh, and this is also um, a missed opportunity. So one of our recommendations was to say that greater synergies between the implementation of the greening and the agrarian environmental climate, climate measures in Pillar 2 should be encouraged. In particular, when it comes to uh, uh, the greening measures, um, one thing that, for instance, uh, illustrates uh, very well that member states have not gone for the most uh, optimal uh, options for the environment is ecological focus areas, because there, member states during the negotiation managed to include crops in the list of uh, eligible elements, um, while again this was meant to protect biodiversity and it was meant to be about landscape elements, not about production. And in the choices, most of the member states have gone for the crops and eventually what we see that on the land, 70% of the ecological focus areas more or less are crops and not landscape features, landscape elements. So one of our recommendations was that the type of EFAs, ecological focus areas permitted and the management would should be reviewed and to ensure that they are compatible with delivering environmental outcomes and hence should be focused on uh, um, landscape elements uh, and not on crops. Um, on permanent crops out of the scope here, it's quite important to highlight that also again during the negotiation, what happened is that member states um, put permanent crops out of the scope of greening. What does that mean? It means that permanent crops are exempted from greening requirements. And that is particularly a problem for the southern part of Europe, where there is no environmental requirement in a way for this type of crops. Uh, so again, we, we draw a recommendation based on that. And in when it comes to the protection of grasslands, Member states had to designate which grasslands they wanted to protect. Uh, unfortunately, what we had seen is that member states did not protect all the grasslands in Natura 2000 and also underused the possibility to protect uh, environmentally sensitive grasslands outside of Natura 2000. So overall, uh, the, 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 the environmental performance of the current cap is pretty low um, and um, it's not necessarily matching with one of its objectives, which is the sustainable management of natural resources and it's worth also adding that uh, this was not only the the outcomes of uh, the greening evaluation from IEP but also this has been found uh, and echoed by the European Court of Auditors itself in a report that they released quite uh, uh, recently and they also said that uh, in a way what happened is that greening uh, in pillar one somehow impacted negatively the environmental ambition level of uh, uh, pillar two so what about the future cap? Uh, obviously, lessons have to be drawn from what has happened with greening, and uh, the Commission, uh, in theory, should have taken that into account in order to set plans for the future cap. So the future cap's objective um, are set in two different boxes, let's say. You have the general objectives and you have the specific ones. I will come to the specific ones in a, in a second. So the general objectives of the future cap are very similar to the objectives of the current cap. You have one on the environment, one on the social aspects, and one on the economic aspects. And you also have a cross-cutting one, which is uh, about innovation, uh, research and development, and modernization of the sector. The specific objectives, uh, there are nine in total. Um, they are here on the, on the screen, as you can see. I'm not gonna go into all of them in details. I will focus on the ones that are relevant uh, for the environment in particular, which are here. So you have one on climate. Uh, so the future cap is meant to contribute to climate change mitigation and adaptation. One on natural resources, uh, so foster sustainable development and efficient management of natural resources such as water, soil and air, and one specifically on biodiversity and landscapes. The way the future cap will be structured, I will have a slide on the on the on the structure of the cap uh, later on, but that you you have this in these, these specific objectives which uh, 
Unfortunately, as you can see on the slide, are not very specific. Uh, and this, this will actually be a problem uh, for the environmental performance of the future CAP and for the accountability of the member states as well. So you have this uh, so-called specific objectives. And on that basis, you have impact indicators that will be used to um, evaluate the performance of the CAP on a multi-annual basis. And then you have results indicators that will, in theory, help to assess the performance on the CAP on an annual basis. And here, I just wanted to take the example of the biodiversity objective. And uh, on the slide, you have the, the way the impact indicators and results indicators, the way they have been proposed by the Commission in its proposals uh, now. So this is uh, from the legal texts. Um, as you can see, the problem with the result indicators is that um, they are not referring directly to um, the legislation. What we said um, in this uh, analysis uh, that we did for WWF recent, just before the, the CAP proposals uh, were out, um, we insisted on the fact that it was of paramount importance for the CAP objectives uh, related to the environment to draw a direct link with the environmental objectives under the environmental legislation. So for instance, on the biodiversity objective, there should be the objective should refer directly to the habitat directive and to Natura 2000 um, and to the, yes, to the, to the birds directive. That, that, that is a uh, us that was fundamental. The same for climate, for instance. We have a climate and energy package. There is a legislation on effort sharing. There is an effort sharing regulation for member states. There are targets there, uh, quantitative targets. These targets should be reflected in the indicators of the future cap. Because otherwise, you might have two different policies going in parallel, and one of them might eventually be less ambitious than, than the ones that is, in theory, meant to be the requirements. The, the environmental legislation and the climate legislation. So um, the future cap structure now, how how will you know how the the, the, the structure will will, will be uh, formulated? So basically, uh, you would have, um, as I said, you know, you still have direct payments and pillar two, so the structure remains more or less the same. What is different, though, is that uh, the Commission is proposing to include greening within conditionality. So greening will be absorbed by cross-compliance in a way that they call now new enhanced conditionality. That would be mandatory for all farmers. And then on that basis, you know, you would have um, the pillar one and pillar two. You would have the agree environmental measure in pillar two. And in pillar one, you would have the possibility for the member states, not the, sorry, the, the, it's mandatory for the member states, my mistake here. So member states will have to propose eco scheme to farmers in pillar one, but that would be voluntary for farmers to take it or not. The same as it is in Pillar 2, they don't have to apply the measures in Pillar 2, agri-environmental, et cetera, agri-environmental measures, et cetera. It's up to them to decide whether or not they want to go for it. The ring fencing link in Pillar 1, so the 30%, you remember that in the current cap, you have 30% spending for environment, but which is not very um, optimal. As I said, you know, the, 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 the actual delivery on the ground is very low, but still you have that uh, monetary link between the measures and the, and the budget. This is disappearing in the future cap. So there won't be that 30% link for greening measures in, in, in the future cap. In the mind of the Commission, it's because, in a way, this is being shifted under the, 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 the level below, which is conditionality. But still, this is, this, is, this is a big loss in terms of environmental ambition, we think, this, man this mandatory link between the budget and the measure. And in Pillar 2, they keep the 30% minimum spending for environment. So this, is, uh, this remains. So how this will work? So you have, a, as I have presented in uh, that slide, uh, you have the new uh, specific but not so specific objectives. So that's EU uh, specific objectives. Then on that basis, you have the indicators, uh, impact and results. And then you would have a, a list of potential interventions that member states can use. So this will all be done at EU level in the EU framework. And then member states 
will have a lot of flexibility in the way they interpret the, the objective themselves. They will have to set their own targets at national, at national level. But these targets should be based on needs assessments that they would have done uh, before that. So they would have to identify their needs, as you can see in, the, uh, in one of the green uh, bar. Uh, they would have to tailor their intervention to their needs, and then they would have to deal with implementation and uh, also show progress towards targets uh, to the Commission. What's important to see here, the fundamental difference between the CAP now and the future CAP is that we're moving from a compliance-focused uh, policy where EU or Brussels was checking what farmers were doing, whether it was fitting or not with the EU requirements, to um, a results-oriented policy where EU slash Brussels set the overall objectives and member states have a lot of flexibility in the way they set their plans in order to receive that objectives. In theory, that's an interesting and a good way to go, also to allow flexibility for the member states to tailor uh, the measures to their needs. In theory, that should be more optimal for the environment because the needs are not the same in the south, in the north, in the east, in the west. But we have to keep in mind that what happened last time, that when flexibility was given to the member state, they were systematically going for the lowest uh, ambitious measures. So if you really, if the Commission really wants this future cap to perform well for the environment and to increase the level of ambition, as uh, it's uh, said also because the Commissioner said that it will increase the level of ambition when the, the proposals were released, then you should have a strong accountability mechanism in place. And that is unfortunately what is lacking in the, um, in the proposals now. At least it's not very strong in there. I will come back to that. So this is just to give you um, an, uh, an overview of how the things will work. So you have this cap general objective and specific objective. Then you have the, the strategic plans at the bottom. And in between, you have all the different measures that member states can pick and choose in order to respond to their targets that will be set on the general and specific objectives from the from from the commission from the from the eu from the eu texts so these are just the list of measures there are no new measures in that it's basically the same measures as what we have now in the cap it's just that member states can tailor them a bit uh, better in theory for the, in the future cap uh, the new measures uh this, the there are i mean it's not to say that there are no new measures there are a few new measures on the environmental part under the heading environment, and I will come back on that. Um, so the comparison between the two models, I tried to 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 pick the the, the main differences somehow to summarize it uh, a bit the differences. Um, so the objective and targets again we are moving from a compliance uh, focused policy to a results focused policy. So right now, the cap uh, in the current uh, programming period um, is again evaluated against the general objectives, but member states are not required to actively contribute to this. This would be fundamentally different in the future cap. They will be required to do so, and they will have, to, in theory, to demonstrate to the Commission that their national plans are contributing to that. So a strong uh, increase in terms of subsidiarity. Uh, in terms of the design of the measure, right now, all measures are de designed in detail at EU level, even the, 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 the way, you know, how long your head should be under ecological focus areas, etc., and greening are all established at EU level, and then member states, um, farmers have to comply with that. That said, you still have a lot of uh, uh, flexibility in the details for the for the member states. This would be uh, different in the future. The Commission will define the range of acceptable intervention types, but member states will be free to design and choose the specific intervention. Uh, member states will be able to uh, will have a lot of flexibility also um, in the choice to set um, in the selection uh, of the different policy instruments from pillar one to pillar two, etc. Uh, they will have to propose the eco scheme, as I said, uh, but member states uh, farmers, sorry, will be free to choose them or not. Uh, 
And when it comes to uh, spending for environment uh, in particular, so as I said earlier on, uh, the big difference is that now you have this 30% link in pillar one for the environment. This is disappearing in pillar two. Uh, it is replaced by this eco scheme, but there is no um, budgetary link, uh, money linked attached to it. While the minimum spending for environment in pillar two is day. Um, what is um, what are the different environmental measures uh, in the future cap in detail? So now you have an understanding of the new structure, how the new uh, uh, cap will work, um, how the um, I mean to what extent member states will have more subsidiarity in their choices, etc. What are the different objectives? What are the indicators? How this will all work? Now I wanted to focus uh, more in details on the future environmental measures uh, of the gap. As I said, most of them are very similar to what we have now. There are a few new things and I will highlight them. So the enhanced conditionality is meant to absorb existing greening. So it's a merging of cross-compliance and greening uh, de facto into 10 uh, uh, GAEC, so good agricultural and environmental conditions, and 16 statutory management requirements. Um, and conditionality means that all area payments, so basically farmers, when they receive uh, uh, CAP money, will have to be in compliance with this requirement. Uh, I try to highlight here the future conditionality and with the little cross, the red cross, you see what are the new elements. Um, the other ones are the same uh, as what we have now, uh, and uh, including uh, greening, uh, the greening practices that are uh, merged, put into conditionality. So what are the new elements for the environment? Uh, there will be, there are, the Commission is proposing to protect uh, carbon-rich soils such as wetlands and peatlands. Uh, instead of diversification, the Commission is proposing rotation, which has much more sense uh, from an agronomic perspective and from an environmental perspective uh, than diversification. So that is, in theory, a good thing. And the very big novelty, I would say, is this farm sustainability tool for nutrients. So that would be compulsory for all farmers because conditionality would be compulsory. And basically, it's uh, forcing farmers to have a nutrient management plan uh, on, their, on their farm. The, the, maybe one thing that is important to highlight here is that you can see that, like for instance, for uh, agriculture, so on the uh, GAIC 9, the share for agriculture area devoted to um, landscape uh, elements, it says minimum share, but then it will be very much up to the member states to decide what is the percentage. Uh, I want to remind you that right now it says 5% of uh, the land that needs to fall under ecological focus area. So it's much more prescriptive now than it will be in the future. That said, again, uh, even if we have the 5% now, 70% of it is full of crops which do not necessarily benefit for biodiversity and so on. The new eco scheme, so that's the, let's say, yeah, one of the biggest novelty of the, of the future cap. So it is, it is that um, scheme in direct payments in pillar one that will be mandatory for member states but voluntary for farmers. These payments would have to go beyond conditionality because anyway, everything would have to go beyond conditionality. That is the baseline. And there would be annual payments. Um, they can be top up uh, payments to incentivize, reward beneficial practices. So in theory, that could be good for uh, uh, environmental delivery of the future cap and for the environmental ambition. That would be 100% EU finance. So that could be potentially attractive for member states uh, because it won't require them to put some uh, money, uh, co-financing money as it is the case for Pillar 2. Um, and it needs to be coherent with Pillar 2 environmental measures, of course. Um, that said, it doesn't need to go beyond uh, Pillar 2 in terms of ambition, beyond Pillar 2 environmental measures. And what you also have in the, in the future cap as proposed by the Commission, are the agri-environmental measures. Uh, this is not new though. I mean, we have them right now in the current cap. So in a nutshell, what are the risks, uh, the potential mitigation safeguards and the opportunities when it comes to the environmental delivery of the future cap? As I said, one of the things to remember here is that the future cap as proposed by the commission will incredibly increase the level of subsidiarity of the member states. 
seeing what happened last time around when member states were given flexibility to tailor some of the choices to their needs in theory this didn't lead did, didn't lead to an increase in terms of environmental ambition on the contrary as uh, the european court of auditors also said so did that subsidiarity in itself, even if it comes from, uh, you know, the, the thinking is not bad, uh, you know, the needs are not the same in Europe when it comes to environment and farming and member states should be able to tailor best the tools to their needs, etc. But seeing the context, increasing subsidiarity and discretion power to member states might be a risk uh, uh, for the future environmental performance of the CAP. The mitigation safeguards that the proposals contain um, are the fact that, the, in theory, member states have to come up with that needs assessment. So, in theory, they have to justify their choices according to their needs. And we don't believe that any of the member states will be able to hide the biodiversity problems they have on farm on farmland, the water uh, uh, problems they have, soil problems, etc. So in theory, you know, the environmental needs will come out, and they will have them to justify the measures according to to these needs. And the Commission should be able to say, well, we don't think that the measures are not necessarily ambitious enough, seeing the the scale of the needs. Let's see. The whole of the CAP strategic plan, including conditionality, will have to be justified and approved, as I just said. So in theory, there is some power for the Commission to say no to things that are not ambitious enough. And one of the interesting things in the proposal um, is this no backsliding clause, which says, in theory, that um, member states cannot go back on previous uh, environmental um, ambition of the CAP. So basically, their pl future plans should not lead to less environmental delivery than the current cap. That said, that clause is extremely vague, and it's not the check according to our understanding of the legal text. It's not going to be done on the basis of the actual spending in terms of money. So the Commission is not going to spend check how much member states are spending in environmental measures and whether they will do the same in the future. They're not going to check that. They're more they're going to look at it in a holistic manner. They said, but. What does that mean? I mean, it seems extremely vague. It seems that it will very much depend on the person doing the assessment itself, you know, himself or herself. And that would be extremely subjective. And there would be also potentially a lot of uh, power gain there between the Commission and the Member States. So even though it could be a good safeguard, it is not strict enough the way it's written now to be efficient. One of the other bigger risks for the environmental performance of the CAP is the cuts in Pillar 2, because Pillar 2 is multiannual, is where you can have long-term measures, let's say, for biodiversity, for soil protection, etc., uh, in farmland. Uh, the, pillar, the cuts in that pillar are bigger than the cuts in Pillar 1, uh, which is a, a risk for environmental delivery in itself, because there would be less money simply. What are the mitigation safeguards? Well, it's that you still have the 30% minimum spending in Pillar 2. And in theory, what has proposed the Commission is somehow better targeted and they have uh, kicked out, let's say, some measures that were not really targeted at the environment from there. So that could be uh, potentially a good thing. Uh, the potential opportunities are this uh, increase of the baseline, let's say, these new measures in conditionality, so like crop rotation, this nutrient management, as I mentioned earlier on. And also one thing not to be taken into account now, which is also quite good, is that right now the cross-compliance under the CAP is not making a link with the retrofermal directive and pesticide directive, uh, which is uh, um, somehow problematic and which means if, you know, if you, if you, Put the think if you put the thinking a bit further that farmers who receive payments from the cap right now are not checked uh, whether they are compliant or not with the with the EU water legislation and the pesticides legislation, um, which, which again is quite problematic. But what is proposed for the future cap is that these pieces of legislations are put into conditionality, so that situation should be fixed uh, according to the proposals in theory. The other risk is that we don't have that link, this uh, money link between practices and um, budget um, in Pillar 1 for the environment. The mitigation safeguard is that regardless of that link, uh, budget link, member states will have to propose it. They will have to make it part of the national plans, this eco scheme. 
Um, and if thought well, in a way, this eco scheme could be a bit holistic and could be a way to really incentivize, uh, depending on the level of payments, of course, but that could be a way to really incentivize changes in, 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 in some farming practices, a real transition to sustainable farming. A big risk that I didn't talk about now, uh, but uh, which is something to keep in mind, is that um, right now the cap um, fall under, falls under the common provision uh, regulation um, and hence the, the partnership rules, which force the member states to organize um, a proper consultation with stakeholders, environmental NGOs, etc. for Pillar 2. The future cap will not fall under that anymore, according to the legal drafts, to the legal texts. Uh, on top of that, what the text say that the, so to, to compensate for that, the text says that uh, member states will have to consult with relevant uh, bodies, but it's very much left to the, to the, to the member states to, uh, uh, you know, define what relevant uh, stakeholders are. So they can very well say that environmental NGOs, for instance, are not relevant. On top of that, uh, while they will have, um, in theory, according to the text, um, there will be an annex on how they have consulted with uh, uh, people, partners, NGOs, etc., uh, in the drafting of the um, plans, these parts will not be officially part of the approval process. What does that mean? It means that the Commission won't be able to uh, reject uh, the national plans on the ground that the member state has not done consultation or that the consultation annex is lacking. So that is potentially a, a big risk uh, because that is not a strong incentive for member states to consult with uh, uh, the uh, so-called relevant um, civil society organizations. One of the mitigation safeguards in the in the proposals, as it stands, are this requirement, though, in, in again in the legal text, to involve environmental authorities. So that's the first time that it is really written in there that member states at national level, when it comes to the environmental objectives of the CAP and the environmental measures, they have to involve the environmental authorities. So potentially that would be a, a good step forward because it could help um, strengthen the synergies between the environmental legislation and the common agricultural policy. The potential opportunities is that also, as you've seen, uh, whoops, I didn't go into details of the, of the objectives, but there is this uh, protect food and health quality objective, which is a new one. It's uh, an objective on the societal, oops, sorry, societal expectations uh, uh, on, on, on food and farming. So it contains uh, things like yeah, animal welfare, antibiotics, etc. So. That is a new part, let's say, of the of the cap, recognizing that um, society um, is uh, asking for changing in the food and farming sector. So that could be potentially interesting if member states um, take that uh, objective um, into account seriously. So my last slide um, is that, well, the journey ahead is still very long because, as I said last time around, it took two years and a half for the deal to be adopted. Uh, what I didn't say that there were 7,000 amendments uh, in the European Parliament uh, on the text. Uh, we can foresee that there might be even more, uh, especially at the time when there are elections coming, you know, and it might be the case that uh, uh, members of the Parliament uh, are taking even more amendments on board, uh, you know, in also to, 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 to please their constituencies, etc. So um, it's not sure at all whether there will be disagreement before May. And actually, it's almost, yeah, uh, it's almost pretty clear that there would be nothing before May uh, next year. So there is still a few months before the future cap uh, is adopted. Um, there are uh, a few things that need to be improved uh, for the future cap to um, ensure, as the commissioner stated uh, when the cap proposals were released, to ensure a more resilient agriculture sector in Europe and to increase the environmental and climate ambition of the cap, including its contribution to climate action. So uh, there are a few things that, uh, well, several things that uh, need to be done and to be changed for that. So what would that be? I try to um, highlight here the priorities, again, based, based on our first reaction to the, to the proposals when they were published. So first of all is to, uh, to, to adapt the objectives and to make them uh, more uh, results-oriented, quantified, and not 
uh, vague as they are now because it would be very hard to uh, make member states accountable for uh, reaching or not the objectives if they are not clearly stated. Uh, and they need to be grounded on uh, meeting EU targets and international commitments. So international commitments such as SDGs, obviously, they should appear clearly. It doesn't now. Um, it doesn't in the proposals. There is no clear link to SDGs. Um, and there should be clear links to the uh, EU targets in the objectives themselves and not just in an annex. There should be a robust monitoring of member states' performance, uh, with also wide participation of uh, civil society in that and of the environmental authorities. Uh, so monitoring of the performance and of the results achievements, obviously. Uh, as I said before, there was a big loss, which is the fact that this 30% in Pillar 1 has disappeared. So this should be brought back. Uh, there should be a ring fencing in Pillar 1. The accountability is fundamental, but with accountability goes capacity building. And what do we, do we mean by capacity building? Is capacity building in the Commission. The civil servants will have to be trained because they will have to approve. The, the proposals say that by the time the plans are um, put on the table of the Commission, the Commission has six months to adopt them. So they will have six months to adopt 27 plans that it's potentially massive. So they really need to be ready to know where to look, how to check this no backsliding clause and all of that. I mean, that, 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 that is fundamental. And the same at member states level, because this is a whole change of mindset in terms of the future cap is going into much more subsidiarity, much more responsibilities on the shoulders of the member states. So member states should also be equipped to do that. They should learn how to work with the environmental authorities. Uh, because it's not, uh, I mean, if we see how it works now, there is pretty much in lots of the member states a big division between agriculture and environment uh, ministries, and they're not working well together on the cap. And of course, there should be the right level of engagement from stakeholders. And uh, the fact that you know the partnership principle is not there, that the annex on consultation is not legally binding, uh, are already signed, signed that this can be potentially uh, a, a big problem uh, in some member states. And the right level of environmental authorities' participation as well. And with that, I would ask to thank you for your um, listening. And I hope that um, it was clear enough and that you get a better understanding of the environmental performance of the current and the future cap. Um, and I'm happy to respond to any questions that there are. Thank you very much. Oops. So. Okay. Here we are. Um, thank you, Christine for uh, the very uh, thorough um, overview of, of what uh, is um, promising and what are the challenges in the proposed reform of the common agricultural policy. Uh, I encourage the audience to uh, write uh, questions uh, in case there, uh, there are no questions yet from the audience. We have a few minutes to start. I'm not sure if uh, Professor Pavoni wants to uh, has any question. I might start with one, uh, which um, which goes back to what you said at one point um, about the need to really take an integrated approach and you know seeing the common agricultural policy as part of a wider um, legal and policy framework to which the uh, European Union will um, face. Uh, sustainable development challenges and try to implement the SDGs. Um, and one example which came to my mind was the recent uh, regulation of, uh, that was approved in uh, as part of the, the climate and, and energy package, which had um, sort of a uh, no uh, debit rule in terms of uh, emissions coming from land use, um, and and meaning that uh, member states will have to um uh, essentially um make up for uh, account for emissions coming from land use sector and uh compensate them with actions in that sector i wanted to to um to have um a little bit of uh, your uh, take on 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 this like we are to what extent the other policies of the eu on touching on land use and land management are trying to advance uh, the uh, the objective of sustainable agricultural systems and to what extent these are integrated with the uh, common agricultural policy. You touched a little bit on that, but maybe if you, if you can expand a little bit. Yeah, well, 
clearly right now there is very little coherence uh, that 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 is a big issue also is that um the cap is not necessarily very coherent uh with environmental legislation with climate legislation uh because it has its own uh, let's say targets objectives that are not directly the same as the environmental climate uh, legislation and that is clearly a problem of coherence a fundamental problem of coherence and in some parts also it is going into the opposite direction so it can be even counter uh, countering the environmental legislations and the climate legislation so that is the case of the current cap uh, in the case of the future cap that results oriented approach could in theory help um, fill that gap and, and respond to that problem and make the objectives um, of uh, the environmental legislation and of the climate legislation uh, directly relevant to the common agricultural policy and set them as um, the EU's, within the EU specific in, uh, objectives and within the indicators. Unfortunately, that is not the case. So um, in the draft proposals at, at least, so, for instance, when it comes to climate, uh, the objective, the indicators is as specific as saying reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. That is as specific as it gets. Doesn't mean anything. Then the member states can use whatever baseline it wants, which will not fit with the climate legislation as it is now, um, and can set a level of ambition that is not the same as what we have in the climate uh, regulation, where we have 30% of reduction of greenhouse gas emissions at EU level, and then member states have uh, you know, their own targets at national level. So the way to go would be to transfer, uh, in a way, the, the, um, uh, the obligation that member states have under the climate and energy regulations into the cap, and that should be their targets, the national targets, should be matching with the climate and regulation targets. And then, and under the, the regulation, and then the measures, uh, the specific measures should be mirrored in the two uh, in the two regulations. Because what is the cap eventually? The cap is a pot of money, right? I mean, this is what it is. It's subsidies, it's a pot of subsidies. So we should make sure that this pot of money helps also achieving uh, international commitments that we have that applies for the farming sector, etc. I mean, if we're not doing that, we're completely misusing public money. Thank you, thank you so much for the for the answer, uh, Professor Provoni. Do you uh, want to uh, maybe jump in with a question on your end? I would just like to to follow up on your on your on your question, actually, Dario, because I think that you 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 touched upon one of according to our approach one of the most interesting aspects of postin's presentation is uh, is about this necessity for a kind of holistic approach in european environmental law and policy relating to uh, agriculture uh, ag relating to agriculture uh, so this need to connect the common agricultural policy with the environmental legislation and environmental policy of the eu um, you touched upon the issue of land use and land management in general i have a specific question here if whether 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 faustin has any particular view on the issue of biofuels because this is very much discussed at this very moment especially in countries uh, uh, like italy where uh, we have a lot of public resistance about uh, biofuels and uh, you know devoting enormous areas of agricultural land to this uh, to put in enormous areas of the agricultural land to this use we know that this is a particularly controversial area because biofuels may deliver important uh, objectives when it comes to climate action but on the other hand there's a lot of risks for uh, biodiversity for example so um, uh, do you have any specific uh, uh, view about this and do you know whether this issue of biofuels has come up in any uh, significant way during the consultation process? Uh, I mean, on related to the cap, maybe it was not necessarily the main uh, uh, topic, uh, uh, biofuels. That said, in, in, in Europe, in Brussels, clearly, uh, biofuels is a big topic and uh, this has been gone for quite a while. And now uh, there was a, a law under the climate and energy package that was adopted uh, and that clearly sets a path towards uh, no more 
land-based biofuels, so first so-called first-generation biofuels. So um, that is clear at EU level. That's what has been decided, and member states will have to um, to go for, to, to 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 implement that and to move towards next-generation biofuels, so no land-based biofuels. Well, the view of the institute on that is that indeed first-generation biofuels does conflict with land use because. De facto, with such a legislation, with the biofuels legislation, you were putting a lot of um, um, pressure on land because you were creating artificially a demand for a product that was requiring the use of land, while, while the demands for the other products, such as food, etc., was either remaining constant or increasing. And you have only a limited pot of land available, right? So if you put more pressure, then what happens is that, well, you need to in either to intensify, but there is a certain amount that you can reach, right? Or you are displacing production. And this is what we had seen with biofuels, regeneration biofuels. We ended up, with our first generation biofuels and particularly biodiesel, displacing uh, vegetable production to Malaysia, etc., and shifting it to palm oil and having a lot of what we call indirect land use change and all the detrimental biodiversity, climate, etc., impacts that go with it. So clearly, the common agricultural policy should not be supporting biofuels production uh, uh, under uh, now and it's in, in the future. There were cases where the common agricultural policy would be supporting uh, bio um, bioeconomy and, and and also bio second generation biofuels etc. But in theory, the, the common agricultural policy always had to be uh, in compliant. I mean, at least uh, fitting with the uh, regulation on uh, climate and energy and with the law on on, on biofuels uh, in in other pieces of legislation. So in theory, you should have no contradiction. That said, uh, this has not always been the case, but uh, the way, the really the way to make sure that it doesn't happen in the future is really to make sure that you have this strong coherence and that from the objectives themselves, really, you have, uh, you have, you have that merge. But our, our views really on the first generation biofuels is that they are, they, are, they are not the solution to, uh, to, um, to climate change and that they can create a lot of problems when it comes to biodiversity and they can even increase the emissions if you look at the impacts somewhere else, uh, like in Malaysia, etc., the indirect impacts. Yeah, thank you so much about this. Okay, so I would um, maybe end, because we are approaching the end of the webinar with a final question that uh, was sent to us from the audience and I was actually, uh, I was actually trying to uh, uh, ask something similar actually, so I will bid upon that. Um, what do you think of the final balance, uh, that's, that's the question, uh, reached with uh, respect to uh, subsidiarity and, and the flexibility of the member states? And um, I think the, the, what I was going to ask sort of builds a little bit upon that, because um, I, I, wa I wondered whether you came through both in the current uh, uh, cap and in uh, discussions on the reform cap, um, uh, whether you've, you've come across um, the sort of national leadership on the on the use of on the environmental dimension of the common mm -hmm. policies. Have has there been cases of countries which have actually gone uh, beyond uh, what the expectations were, and is it foreseeable? that uh, there is at least a basic level of mutual learning uh, between, between countries in, in, in this respect. Yeah, no, clearly, I mean, as I said, uh, subsidiarity per se is not a bad thing because in theory, it is meant to help member states to target their needs better and to make the policy more optimal in terms of the delivery of environmental goods. So per se, it's a good thing. We've seen in the past that it has been misused, and there is a risk it is misused again. Uh, in terms of what are the member states that could potentially be the drivers, in a way, I mean, I would say they are the usual suspects. Uh, you know, you you have the Nordic countries which are always more advanced than the others, and uh, unfortunately, the eastern part of Europe, where you also have problems in terms of civil society engagement that is not necessarily uh, strongly involved in the process, etc. So, this increased subsidiarity and this we could even talk about a renationalization of the cap might lead to a situation where you have different speeds in Europe in terms of environmental delivery and that would not necessarily be a good thing because environment is a transboundary thing 
uh, and there is no no boundary, no frontier to to environmental problems, soil biodiversity, etc. So if we have countries performing very well, this will not compensate for the countries that are doing pretty bad things. So that's why you really need to leave the space for member states who want to be very good to be the front runner, but you need to have a limit that would prevent the ones that would tend to go very low, not to go that low, but to stay at that level, right? And that's where accountability is fundamental and capacity building for the commission, for the member states, and for the uh, relevant authorities and civil society organizations. They need to, to, to be involved, properly involved in the process, and for that, they need to have capacity building as well. So I think it's correct to think of uh, conditional subsidiarity here, no? Right? Because when you say there is this back, yes. backsliding clause, which I think is very important. Yes, exactly. That is that backsliding clause is crucial, but the way it is, like in legal terms now, it's very vague and it's not very binding. So it needs to be reinforced in order to to to, to have an impact, because otherwise we will have really. Europe to speed Europe, where you would have member states doing great things. And you would also eventually end up in a situation where farmers will be furious because there will be, um, in terms of competitiveness also, that might also end up in a bad situation for them because, you know, we have a common market, but there will be different speeds, different laws in different countries. They will not be subjected to the same law. And that might very well impact their productivity, etc. And they will scream. They will say, it's unfair that in that country, you know, they don't have that requirement. Why do we have that requirement where we are selling to the same, within the same market? And so all of that needs to be taken into account as well. Of course, of course. Thank you so much. I think we don't want to abuse your time anymore. And uh, we, are, we are so grateful for your comprehensive talk. And we do hope to have further opportunities to collaborate with you and your institute in the future. Happy to do so, yes. I mean, this is a, there is a long journey ahead, as I said. It's far from being over. So it's the beginning of the process. <laughs> okay. Well, thank right. you so much. Yes, thank you so much again for uh, for um, uh, agreeing uh, to uh, participate and we also thank the audience for the uh, for the engagement uh, we go in terms of our webinar series into uh, summer mode in the sense that our next webinar will uh, happen around uh, September or very early October uh, we will of course give you uh, more information as uh, the date uh, and uh, the uh, all the information of the speakers become available Thank you so much uh, again to everyone, and uh, thanks again to our speaker, and uh, see you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay.